Evening folks, how you doing? Thanks for joining us tonight for a slightly different episode. Evening to Dave X Unit and Jace and Electrical Skateboard in Finacell and Slow Cool. Good to have you around. Um, yeah, it's a different episode today. This is normally the streams where we do a bit of graphics um, inside and live coding inside Common Lisp. Um, this time um, I'm going to be doing an episode of uh, Little Bits of Lisp, which is another series I've been doing on YouTube. Uh, which we've generally been like five to ten minutes um, videos just explaining an individual thing from Common Lisp. Now, I've been trying to do some videos uh, for that on macros for a while and have really struggled. They haven't fit naturally into that format. So what I was thinking of doing today, or what I am going to do today, is uh, try and do a little episode where we use, I don't know, it might be one hour, it might be a little more, we'll see. Um, it might be less on um, just learning the basics of macros because there's something that people are very interested in naturally because it's meant to be one of the interesting features of Lisp, one of the things that not every language has yet. Um, and it's one of the areas that really shows why Lisp's uh, syntax, its homoiconicity and all that kind of stuff that we hear about is of any interest at all. So without further ado, let's hop over here and um, We'll get into it. So yeah, like I say, they're one of the macros are one of those things that uh, pique people's interest, um, but they almost get like an unfair <laughs> like the, the, then when you find out how they work, they're very non mysterious. Um, the kind of point of this episode really is to point out that uh, at the end, macros are just functions. It's not what they do. Uh, you already. Uh, you, I assure you already, if you've done any Lisp, you understand what, how, what they do and how they do it. They're just like functions. What's interesting is when they do it. And so that's what we're going to get into. And Jace is just letting us know that the audio and video is okay. Thank you, sir. It's, uh, it's good to go on there. Um, yeah, so macros aren't magic. In fact, the, it's been said before that the worst thing about macros is the name. Uh, it's such an overloaded term. I mean, when, when people hear of macros, they might be coming from an Excel background, they might hear macros there, they might be coming from like an Emacs background, which has uh, like keyboard macros or computer games that have keyboard macros and stuff like this. Um, you might be coming from other programming languages, which have C-like uh, macros, which are a very different beast entirely. Um, they're all about, again, taking chunks of strings, basically, and uh, splicing those together. I'm explaining that badly, but... This is a very different animal, and so we're going to look into that. Um, the question that will come up again very early is, what are macros for? What are they useful for? Um, and it's, again, tricky because, as we'll see, macros are functions, essentially. Um, it's like asking, what are functions good for? There's a lot of different things you can use macros for. A lot of the time they fall into a couple of categories, though. You see a lot of macros whose job um, is to... Um, change the, the order of evaluation in some way and other ones that uh, a lot of the time are to do with um, syntactically changing the code making things nicer to write or safer to write and things like this so we're going to look into a couple of examples of those different things uh, we're going to do some simple pointless macros and we're going to try and do a, one that's at least one that's a bit more advanced I'm going to be dancing down here a lot because I've got some notes of what I actually want to get through so bear with me on that uh, but let's see. Yeah, let's start. We're gonna take a really high level view of um, what happens when you compile some code. Like we, we write functions all the time, like defun foo, and it takes an argument, and then we're gonna times that by ten, and we compile it. Now, when we compiled it just then, and it flashed, a lot of things had to happen for it to execute. We're using an impl implementation of Lisp called SBCL. Um, and that compiles this down into machine code. So what's happening, the first part is, this is getting, this is stored in a file um, and it's stored as just text. So it's a, essentially a big old array of characters. Um, all of this, we get very used to thinking about the structure of the code when you write Lisp because you're writing it in this structural fashion. Um, but it begins life just as essentially a string. Uh, so if we take something like this and we shove it inside a string. Whoops, that's not what I was going for. Um, I'll do it again, though. Um, we can wrap this in a function that's going to read it. And the read part of the compilation is to turn it from a string into a data structure. So something that the 
program, the list program can work with. So let's just do read from string. I'm going to be running, as with um, other episodes of Little Bits of Lisp, I'm going to be kind of loose with terminology. Um, I do recommend you look at the hyperspec and see what how, how th like terms are meant to be used. Um, but a lot of time, again, for aiding in conversation and aiding just in getting through stuff. I mean, loose with certain terms. I'm going to try and point you to at, at points where I'm saying, yep, I'm being loose here. Go look this stuff up. So if we say read from string, what we get back, if we just do the type of, of this, so type of the last thing that was returned, we see its type is cons. So these are uh, lists are made of cons cells, and that's why we're getting this here. Um, so this this is a list that we're getting back here. Let's just uh, I'm gonna reformat this a little, bring it back up to the next line, and just say give me the first thing. And we can see that the first thing is the symbol defun, and the second thing, no surprise, is the symbol foo. But the main thing to point out is at this stage we've gone from um, a string where the first element of this string would be this character here, the uh, opening paren, and we've gone to a point where we've got lists. Um, of symbols and numbers and things like this. So that's the first stage. Let's actually start noting these things down. So our compilation, we're going to take our code and it's going to be read. So we're going to go through a read stage and that's going to produce um, what in some languages would be called an AST, an abstract, abstract syntax tree. It's a data structure that represents your code. Now in Lisp, our AST that we think about when we're working in Lisp is very simple. Um, we write things, uh, like our syntax is lists of symbols and um, other self-evaluating objects. So what we get back looks very similar to what we put in. But if you're looking at other languages, if you've worked with compilers for say C or Python and things like this, you'll probably get back um, like arrays of objects or a tree of objects. Um, and there'll be a specific kind of object for a function definition and a specific kind for an if and all that kind of stuff. Um, and an AST, as it goes through um, a compiler, is going to get decorated a lot. It's going to get transformed a number of times, and there's lots of information, like if it's typed language, maybe types get added, and all this kind of stuff. So there's a read stage, which is going to take our strings. Um, and then after that, We've got an AST, our data structure representing our code, and it's going to go through some kind of series of transforms. Now, I'm not going to go into depth of what these are because it's really implementation specific as well as being language specific. Um, but this is a place where that tree is going to get messed with a bit. And then we're going to get actually to what I'll call compilation in here. Um, this is all really part of compiling. Um, We'll just say compile. And this is the stage we're compiling it down, in this case, to machine code. Now, if you're using a different Lisp like ABCL, ABCL is the one that compiles down to the JVM. So at that point, it's producing JVM bytecode. Or if you're using ECL, uh, you might be compiling down to, to uh, JIT and C and stuff like this. Um, so yeah, it depends on what implementation you're using to what you're compiling to. But generally, we're going to get to that stage. And what we're going to end up with is some compiled code that finally we can run or execute. Um, and that's when, yeah, we see some effect. Now let's just turn off this for a second and get back here. So what we can think of macros as being like hooks into the compile process. So when up here um, code is getting read, let's do this in green, uh, we can hook in here with something called reader macros. And this is horrible writing, so my apologies. Reader macros. And then at the transformation step, there's a few things. There's one annoyingly just called macros. I'll, I I tend to refer to them when I'm speaking out loud as regular macros um, to differentiate them. But, but these are, we're gonna be using something called def macro to define these. These are just macros. And then we have another kind um, called compiler macros, which we'll get to later. Later, they're very similar um, in how you use them, but they have some differences, um, and they're generally used for optimization-related uh, transforms. In here as well, there are also symbol macros. I'm not sure where to shove that exactly. I guess in the transform stage as well, maybe around here. Let's just shove it in here. Whoop. 
Um, and I always forget these, so I will have to make sure... Whoop. Symbol macro, that is unreadable. And that's not any better, but still. Symbol macros is another kind of macro we're dealing with there as well. But anyway, we're hooking into these different stages and we're going to transform the code in some way. So generally what we're trying to do is we're taking some code and then we're transforming and returning some new code that will be used in its place. And a lot of this stuff sounds fairly airy-fairy until we actually get into something. So we're going to keep going so we can get there. Um, also, if uh, you're new to this kind of stuff, especially if you're new to this, please do ask questions in the chat. It's very welcome. I'm happy to detour at any point and do that. Um, but otherwise, I'll just keep on rolling. So, also, if you spot any mistakes, please call them out. Okay, so where are we going to look at? See, I was saying before that um, one of the things we might want to do is um, syntactic. So, we've actually used some things in this before, even in the uh, little bits of Lisp streams. Um which are implemented as macros. We looked at cond and we looked at case. So let's do that now again. What we're gonna do is we're gonna write a little function called bar. It's gonna take something and then we're gonna do a con statement. And we're gonna say if this x is equal to five, um, then we're going to return uh, the keyword high, and if it's 10, uh, we're going to return by. And otherwise, we're just going to return nil. So let's compile this, and let's just run bar so we make sure we understand what we get. We pass in 5, we get high. Pass in 10, we get by. Pass in anything else, like nil, and we get back nil. Or pass in foop or foo, and we get back nil. Does roughly what we'd expect. Now, what is con though? Like, what is really going on here? I'm gonna actually add another clause just for reasons of uh, explanation that will become clear a little later. What is actually going on here? We're basically saying, hey, if this is true, then do this. Else, if this is true, do this. Else, if this is true, do this. So if we were gonna write an equivalent, um, ugly version of this, we would say something like, if equal five high, if equal 10 by, if equal 15, oops, boo, and otherwise nil. So bar two is equivalent to bar. Oops, bar two, we're gonna pass in 10. Pass in five. But it's not nice to write this because again, like this nesting gets annoying very quickly. Um, so it would be it's nice to have something that would do something like this for us. Um, but if we go and go to if we take cond here, this thing, and we're gonna stick it here, oops, and we're gonna put a quote in front. Remember that the quote symbol um, means do not evaluate this. Just return it as data. So what we get back is a list um, that it contains, again, the, our code, essentially. This is our unevaluated code. And we can call a function on this called macro expand. So let's um, do this again. We're going to say macro expand this. And look what we get back. Something very familiar. In fact, the exact same code we have here. So what is happening is a macro called cond is expanding this code into this code, which is, which is um, again, valid Lisp code. And the reason we have this is, again, simply stylistic, sim simply syntax-based. We just wanted something that's nicer to write. So what we're going to do is, uh, yeah, actually, should we implement this? Maybe we won't. I, so I, I guess the general idea is just to see that these kinds of things, um, some of these compile time... Um, sorry, let me wind back. At the moment, we, so we've looked at, in like our very first video, we looked at the evaluation rules of Lisp. And we found that there are some things like uh, that are self-evaluating objects, like uh, keywords and numbers and fractions and 
what else was in their strings are all self-evaluating. When you evaluate them, they return exactly what you put in. But there are other forms which are not self-evaluating. You have things like pi. Um, when you evaluate a symbol, it's treated as a variable. It goes, ah, this is the name of a variable. I'll go and look up the value that's bound to that. And when we uh, write a list, what it does is it says, okay, the first element of the list, list must be a symbol. And that symbol is going to name a function. Go get that function and then call it uh, with whatever these evaluate to. So in this case, one would evaluate to one, two would evaluate to two. This, they go and find the addition function and they call the addition function with the arguments one and two and we get a result. But look at this code. This is not correct. This will, like, if you, if we change this to, let's, uh, let's put our cond thing down here. If we try and pass this stuff to bar, it's going to freak out and say, this is an illegal function call because it's trying to find a function named named list containing the symbol equal the symbol x and the number 5 which is an illegal name for a function so this this uh this code here would be invalid in the standard rules of evaluation unless it was transformed into something else um, and that's what uh, this uh, uh, that's what the cond macro is doing. It's transforming into if statements, which are well known. Now, again, in this case, it's also slightly interesting because if is one of those special forms we mentioned in an earlier video, actually from the same evaluation video. This is one that obeys different rules. Um, so we can say if I, I don't know, like pi is less than ten, um, then. Fuzzy missiles. Actually, this was the example, wasn't it? Like, um, are the Russians coming? Or are the Americans coming? Depending on what country you're in, you've got to worry about different people. Otherwise, uh, have a nap. So if the Russians are coming, we're going to fuzzy missiles. Um, are the fuzzy missile? Let's hope there's more than one. Otherwise, we're going to have a nap. Now, if can't be a regular function, because a, the rules of a regular function are evaluate this, then evaluate this. Oh, sorry, evaluate this, and then this, and then this, and then call the function with whatever these evaluated to. In which case, we would have checked if the Russians are coming, fired some missiles, gone to sleep, and then called um, the function, which is a disaster. We want to say, if this is true, do this. Otherwise, do this. Um... The real Rady J says, isn't the problem here that EQL um, X5 doesn't evaluate to a function? Yes, but also I, I think um, that the only um, functions, the only list forms that can evaluate to a function name are um, um, setf forms. So if you have the list set f and a symbol, that's a valid function name, but that's the only function names that are allowed to, that are legally named by lists ah. but yes let's have a look, look at another one quickly let's say we were interested in let's do a baz function we're gonna get a lot of badly named functions here let's say we have case and we look at the um the length of whatever we pass in and if it's got zero length we're gonna return high and if it's got a length of one we're gonna say bye and if it's got a length of two, we're going to save it. Once again, what is this? Really, what we've got here is we've got... We want to evaluate this and then keep that in a variable. Um, and then we want to check if it's equal to this, EQL to this, then we will return this. If it's EQL to this, we return this. And if it's EQL to two, return this. Otherwise, return nil. And once again we find a macro. Now there's a little bit of syntax here that's unusual. You'll see that the this variable name here is rather strange. We're going to get to that later. But this is a valid variable name. Um, and so we store the value of evaluating length in here. And then we do a cond, which again we've recently seen is also a macro. So we can expand this. And this turns into what we just said out loud down here. We take the length, we check it, and then we do EQL. 
and compare these all the way down. And we can see that uh, these forms are not evaluated, so they've had a quote put in front of them. Also, this view that I've got on the uh, right-hand side, I'm sorry I didn't introduce that. The first time we played with things, we used, uh, we used that macro expand function. And it's all right, um, but there are much nicer ways of interacting with things. Um, if you go to the beginning of a form in Emacs, or in, um, I, I suppose, in Vim, if you're using, uh, what's it called? Not slime. Oh, it's the equivalent of slime. Slim, no? What's it over there? Slim B, that was it. And if you do control C and then hit return, it expands the macro and brings it open over to this buffer over here. And what's really nice about this is you can then do control C and return again on any other macro form in here. And that will expand in place inside this buffer. And if you've expanded something too confusing, you can do undo and it will close it back up again. And that's just like, this is the primary way you'll end up debugging macros um, is just seeing what they expand to and then iterating here. What's also nice is if you change the definition of the macro, as we'll see later, and come into this view and hit G, it refreshes it. You see these variable numbers, sorry, these variable names changing each time we reevaluate, which is oh, so useful. So useful because you're going to, again, one of the things that's nice with Lisp or any of these kind of interactive languages is that. Um, you can play with stuff. You can make a change and see what it does. Make a change, see what it does. And that back and making that backwards and forwards really fast, it just changes the experience entirely. So yeah, I want to see what's going on in the comments because there's some lovely stuff coming in here. Um, the real Ray DJ is saying, uh, but if it evaluated to a lambda, the expression will be evaluatable. Um, I will get back to you on that one. Um, Jays is saying uh, common list won't evaluate expressions at the head of the li list. No, it will do for lambda expressions. It's one of those concessions that were made um, to uh, when the spec was being made. I think it was, I can't remember which of the early lists had this. Um, oh, I suppose scheme is one of the ones that has this. But if you do scheme, ec uh, sorry, <laughs> I can't words. Uh, if you do lambda at the head here and then do 10, we get 100. And it's one of the few places that stuff is... That's actually the only place that you can do this kind of thing at the head of a list. Whereas Scheme will allow you to evaluate something and then we'll use that as the function name as well. It's cool. Hey, Vanalyzer. Um, Chase is saying, yeah, but Lambda expressions are function names. Interesting. Oh, well, that's good. I didn't know that. I have to read down so I don't explain the wrong thing. Cool, so we've seen a couple of examples here of macros which are used for a kind of syntactic transformation. Um, we've got something that would otherwise be nasty to write, but thanks to macros um, are not. So we know, like, like I said, some of these things, this wouldn't be valid syntax and this wouldn't be valid syntax unless it was transformed into something else. And the fact that it happens at that point, did I lose that? Um, Oh, yeah, I lost the little doodles from earlier. Um, that type of macro is hooked in at the transformation stage. So all the code is read in. We've got that data structure, and then we're transforming this data structure, which is very easy because it's just lists, and we've got great tools for working with lists in this language. Um, one of the things that actually for the rest of this video um, is going to have to be kind of familiar to you is quasi-quotation. Um, it's a way of making lists. So if you do back, um, this uh, back tick here is the quasi-quote. Um, if we just do one, two, three, it, it's pretty familiar. Like it's not evaluating the arguments. But what's interesting about it is you can then do comma and an expression, and that expression will be evaluated and the result will be placed inside. Um, so we might do something like loop for i below 10, collect i and a and three. And you can see this list is now the second element um, in the containing list. Let's move that down to a new line as well. Boop. And there is another kind of um, unquote, the uh, comma at. There's another, there's more as well, but I won't go into those because they're not as often used. Um, and this one is splice. And what that does is you see that the results, instead of like it, we've, the 
sorry. The uh, thing, the expression after a comma at must evaluate to a list, empty or otherwise. Um, and then it's going to splice the contents of that list in into the uh, outer list. So here we can see the one there, and then we've got all the contents uh, generated by our loop, and then we've got A3. We're going to be using this extensively, um, and so if you're really wanting to understand what's going on in this video, I recommend going and checking out the QuasiQuote video and playing with that stuff uh, first. But you may be brave and also hang around. You are do not have to leave. Um, Okay, so let's have a look. We had a look at con in case. Um, and yes, we've seen that some of this stuff has implications on how things are evaluated. Like code that would otherwise, that is clean, but would otherwise be invalid is transformed into valid Lisp code. Um, we talked a little bit about stages of compilation. We had a look at reading things in to turn it into a list. And we've had a look at uh, expanding macros. Now, what's very important to know is that a macro, again, these transformations are only taking place during compilation. So you cannot call um, cond, for example. So let, let's have a quick look. So normally we have something like plus one, two, three. And plus is a function. Um, so we can refer to it like, like this. And we get the same answer. So this is an, a function object. If we just take this, this designates a function rather. Um, we get back the function called plus itself. And then we call that with some arguments and everything's hunky dory. We cannot do this with cond and we cannot do this with case. Um, so if we do fun call cond, it's gonna tell us that there is no function um, called cond and all of this code is invalid anyway so this isn't going to work so it's actually crashing right here saying this isn't a valid function name but even if we passed it let's just pass it one two and three um you can see that it's saying oh the function cond is undefined and that's true there is no function defined called cond there is a macro and a macro is going to do its thing at compile time so what is happening is as this is being compiled this gets read in and the compiler is going to go through all these forms. And when it sees a um, list like this that starts with a symbol that names a macro, it's going to call that macro, passing in these things unevaluated. So just passing them in as lists or numbers or whatever they actually are. And then this is going to return new lists. And that's going to be the replacement code. So when we saw the macro expansion like this, it's returning a list containing this stuff. And that gets put here in place of all of this and hopefully that will become a bit more concrete as we get through um, and if not how many in either the chat and also in the YouTube comments would love to hear from you again because this is again this is a, a little bit of a lisp video please do um, use it dump questions there we can use it as a learning resource I'm happy to even re-record this there's a good chance if this doesn't come out quite the way I want I'll turn these into mini videos or do a re-recording it's a bit more you know spiced up a little more professional but we'll see okay so let's um get into an actual macro that we write ourselves because we're just looking at things i'm saying oh this is a macro and you can look at the spec and you can see what it says a macro is and what aren't um but it's a lot nice to see them ourselves so let's start with something, and we're going to start with something useful because it, it's very easy to make trivial examples, but the problem with trivial examples, as ever, is they are trivial. They, they apply very little to real life. So let's look at um, the using statement from C-sharp. C-sharp has this pattern called disposable. Um, you can define objects and you can say that they implement um, the disposable, iDisposable interface. And it means that you can call dispose on them and it's going to... Um, dispose of whatever resource that thing is holding. So you find out that like, things like files are disposable. Um, things that you don't necessarily want managed by the garbage collector, cleaned up by a garbage collector, but you want to be able to specify exactly when. So we might make a method called uh, dispose. And dispose is going to take some object. And the default is it's not going to do anything. Like it's just going to re uh, return nil. So we can say 
This bow is one, and we get nothing back. That's fine. Well, we get nil back, rather. But let's f define a a uh, class. So this is going to be um, a handle, and it's going to hold on to some resource. And then we are going to define a dispose method for it. And it's going to be an object of type handle. And when we receive this, we're going to, we're just going to print something out. We're going to format T. I'm just going to write out some stuff to the, um, the shell. We'll say um, disposing. And then we're going to put in here the slot value of object resource. Cool. Let's see if that works. Oh yeah, and then we're going to return nil because I want to keep that up. So now we're going to make an instance whoops, of handle. Um, and let's actually change it so we can pass in the resource at um, instantiation time. So let's call init arg. Um, we're going to call it resource. And I'm actually going to just put an init form here just in case I forget to specify it. So we'll say resource is 10. Or allo. So here's an object that we've got. It's a handle. And now when we call dispose on this, we can see that it's saying it's disposing our resource, disposing the string allo. Um, now the way... Actually, I'm going to jump to the comments very quickly and then I'm going to come back to this. Um, <laughs> da, 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 da. Hey, Kicker, I'm saying what happened. I've lost my beard and went back to introductory level Lisp. Yes, we're doing an episode of Little Bits of Lisp this week rather than Pushing Pixels uh, because I've, this is, I got stuck trying to do these as small videos. Um, Ethan B. Morgan saying, any type of Lisp question? I mean... Feel free to shout it out, man, if it's completely out of the bounds. Like, if I can't answer it in a reasonable amount of time, I'll um, save it for the end of the stream. But yeah, shout out. It's cool. Now, this is very easy to implement this part in any language, right? So, um, like, uh, what did uh, Java had closable and uh, C Sharp had iDisposable. But C-sharp got this pattern called using. So you could say using um, whatever the resource was, x e like var, I can't remember how you do it, like var x equals open and some path. Um, and then, oh, it's hard to write this. And then at the, you do a bunch of stuff in here and at the end of this scope, it would call dispose on um, x for you, which was nice. It was a nice pattern because otherwise you would have to do Things like try um, var x equals open. Um, and then you'd have to make sure not to screw anything up. And then in a finally statement, uh, you would have to call dispose. And this stuff is just fragile to refactoring. Like people in a hurry breaking things. It's not as clean as it could be. It's not obvious um, what this pattern was. It's very easy to get polluted with other things. Now, Java didn't get syntax for doing this for fucking ages. Like, I think it was Java 7. But, I mean, they had many editions before then where it just didn't get in. And what a real bummer in general is, when it comes to syntax, that is something that you have to plead with the implementation and say, please add this nice syntax for doing this thing that we all want to do. And then you hope that it's, that idea is going to get ratified and put into a version. Um... But, uh, but yeah, you're at the mercy of the people building the implementation. If you're able to extend the syntax of your language in your own way, things can be much nicer. And that's what we're gonna, that's what we're gonna do right now. So we are going to, look, the first thing we're gonna do, and this is a common pattern when writing, especially syntactic macros, is to write the equivalent code. So if we were gonna call dispose on something at the end, um, we would do, let's do it. Um, yeah, we'll do it here, defun test, um, we would have something like let, and then whatever the variable is, like so x is, um, and we'll do it as make instance. Let's just use what we had up here. And we'll 
bring this down onto a new line. Didn't make it any better. <laughs> oh well. This is one of these things like I got, um, just really helps to have a slightly smaller font size. Uh, okay, so we've assigned it to a variable and then we're gonna say unwind protect. Uh, and then a progon, and then we're going to have a body, and it's going to be whatever we execute in the middle. Let's just say print lots of work happening. And then at the end, we need to dispose of this thing. So we're going to call dispose on x. And this, um, this is going to be roughly equivalent. Uh, the unwind protects means that even if an exception is thrown in here, this cleanup code is always going to get run. Um, so then if we call test, we will see lots of work is happening. And then we got disposing of LO. And because this evaluated, because a print statement evaluates to the thing it's printing, um, that's what was returned. Cool. But again, just like with the C-sharp example, um, this is kind of ugly. So we want a macro that's going to generate the same code. So how could we make something that makes the right kinds of lists. So gen um, using code, right? And then some form and the body. And this is, again, this is not how we would necessarily normally write this macro, but I want to do it step by step to see the kind of intuition. So let's take this. And because we're returning, we want to return the code to do something not actually do it itself. Let's put a back quote at the beginning. And we're gonna pass in, we've passed in the form, so we want to put that here. X is gonna get bound to form. And then we've got this unwind protect. Actually, we want to be able to specify what the name of this variable is as well. So let's pass in var and we can say var here. And then here, Body is going to be a list, so we'll splice in body. And then at the end, we're going to dispose var. So if we now call gen using code, again, this is just a regular function. We pass in x unevaluated. We pass in, um, let's do this properly, the code for making a resource. And we pass in the code print lots of work happening what we get back is the code we want to evaluate so if we ran this now we get it executes how we expect so we have a function that generates code let's um actually do go the final step and do this as a macro so let's take this again i'm going to do def macro uh, we're going to write the using statement Sorry, we're going to call this macro using. Uh, we're going to take a var, a form, and a body. And we're going to do this. Now, this you probably haven't seen before. Um, this is exactly the same as at rest, except that it tells the editor that it is um, it should indent it slightly differently. You'll see that um, the bodies of macros are indented with uh, two spaces generally, and um, the... Uh, like the, uh, sorry, yeah, and, and the bodies of, uh, sorry, the, uh, the arguments to macros um, are indented with two spaces, like here, um, and functions um, tend to be indented to line up with the other arguments. Um, so if we do foo, one, two, three, we can see that these are lining up like this. Okay, this is our macro. What we can do now is rewrite test. Let's just move it down here and call it test2. We're going to say using x form and then print lots of work happening and compile this and it compiles fine, no errors. Test2, lots of work happening, disposing a So what's going on here? Let's expand the macro doing control C and return. And we see that it generated exactly what we wanted. So, what happens is at compile time, 
it get the uh, compiler gets down to here and goes, okay, this is name this uh, using symbol names a macro. So what we'll do is we'll pass the symbol x as this argument. We'll pass this list as this argument. It's not evaluating it. This isn't runtime. This is still all compile time. And it um, brings the rest of the stuff. And I've just noticed that uh, this should be. So if I compile this as rest, which I think I did. Ah, oh, indentations actually correctly. Never mind. We'll use that body. Um, and then it's going to... Sorry. So this symbol becomes var. Uh, this list is form. And then everything else, so 1, 2, etc., is all going to be put into body. In fact, we can, um, we can demonstrate this ourselves. If we do print var and print form and print body... And then all we're going to do, that we're not going to evaluate this, we are going to, I'm going to open the REPL down here, because there's going to be a few moving parts here. There's the REPL. Here's our macro. And I'm going to expand this macro. So we do this, and you can see the resulting code over here. This is the result of the expansion. And notice that stuff has printed out. Now, we haven't run anything yet. This is just at compile time what is happening. So you can print at compile time. You can call any function at compile time. It's the same language. You don't have to use any specific macro syntaxy stuff. Um, this is just a function that gets com called at compile time. And uh, we can see that the, the uh, var was bound to the symbol x. Here's our list. And here's the list of the body. And then we splice this together in this quasi quote. And this is, becomes the return value of this, um, this macro. And because it's the return value, it replaces this whole um, expression here, gets replaced, this whole form here rather, gets replaced with whatever we generate from the using macro. In which case is this. So then we're able to just to say using and we can pass in a foo like this and we're going to go get rid of those print statements because it just gets confusing otherwise doot, doot, doot. we can do test2 um, and then we'll pass in where's that thing, make instance Woo! and we can see that this is run so foo is bound to the symbol, is bound to this variable x. Some stuff is done. And um, yeah, and then foo is disposed right at the end, just like it would in C sharp. And we were able to add that syntax in a couple of seconds, um, as opposed to what the Java folks had to endure, which was waiting a long time for the like implementers to make it part of the language. And it's not to knock the implementers of those languages, they have to weigh up the needs of everyone. And that's a real bug. If, you, if your language can only contain the things that suit everyone, um, then there's a lot of things and conveniences that are never going to make it in there. Um, whereas with macros, you're able to add things that and syntactic abstractions and things like this that are appropriate for less people. And we can ship them around as libraries. And that becomes really useful. So we'll get back to that later. But this is our first macro, and it's actually something that you'll see in the wild is stuff like this. So we went through a few stages. We found a pattern that we liked. We're like this kind of thing, we want to see we want to have this, but this is very hard to reason about at a glance what this is for. Um, especially if there was actually lots of things going on in this function. It would be really nice to have some simple syntax. So we thought up a syntax for it, using, uh, which was established by other languages, the using um, statement. And then we found out how to generate the, the lists that would be the code. Um, so basically, how to generate this as a list. And then we shoved it in a macro, and that was it. And you'll find this is a pattern that when you're designing macros, you do a lot. You find something complicated, you extract the pattern, um, and then you put that pattern into macro. So let's remove this. In fact, we can just get rid of all of this. And that's really cool. And so now we have the dispose pattern. That's kind of groovy. I'll do something slightly shorter than that. 
So that's the first kind of macro. And we're going to do another syntactic kind of macro, another one that's based on um, a need. But first things first, I've got to look at the comments because there's some stuff going on. I need some coffee as well. Dun, 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 dun. Ethan B. Morgan is uh, asking, if <laughs> he wants to ask like, a random list question, will there be a new standard for Lisp or someone who will take up the mantle of the current standard? No, pretty much no. I, I don't believe that will happen. Um, there are de facto standards that have emerged, um, obviously, since the standards. So, like, if you're doing threads, you're probably using Bordeaux threads. If, you, if you're... Um, yeah, if, you, if you're do, working with garbage collection, there are things for that. If you want to use an FFI, there's CFFI. None of these have been standardized by a formal body, but they have been adopted en masse by the community. And, you know, that, that's, that's good enough for the most part. Fundamental changes to the language, yes, would need ratification and all that kind of stuff. There is the CDR kind of project that's been around forever, so people can propose these kind of things. There are a couple of things in that I think are really interesting. I would love to see in the language. And I have things, obviously, myself that I would like to see. But I actually, for the most part, don't think there should be a new whole standard. And I'm kind of relieved in general that, it, like, I, I like the stability of the language. Um, and due in part a lot to macros, I haven't... There, there's been a lot I've been able to do, like all the Kepos stuff, for example. Heavily reliant on macros and all that kind of stuff. And I haven't needed to go beyond the spec there yet. There are some things that are especially around performance that I would be interested in, but that might not gel well with other people. So I, in general with specs, I would rather see them giving you more access to the internals than, um, than yeah, trying to put these things into the spec itself. I mean, there are projects, but I, every one I've seen has been very uninteresting or kind of or almost proves the point. Like CL21, I'm not a fan. I'm sure there's, there's definitely people who are. Um, any any time where I hear things of like making it more kind of object oriented -y, I get really distressed because that's not what I want to use this language for. And it's kind of nice <laughs> that that hasn't happened. Um Ethan B. Morgan saying, I want a Lisp that's like Clojure but doesn't run on the JVM. Oh, well, you got Clojure script. It runs on another VM. Um, yes, as uh, Jay said, it depends on what you consider modernization for sure. Carp looks interesting, Bone looks interesting, and uh, what am I thinking of? Um, Scopes looks very interesting as well. The guy who works on that is very smart. Damascena dude. No, and I, I would be really dis like so. Uh, Jace is saying even if it were an update to the uh, spec CL, wouldn't go that far in the direction of closure. No, it would be a terrible idea. Closure is good at doing what closure does. CL shouldn't be that. It's like closure is about. Uh, it's just it's just a whole different model. I would hate if uh, common list went immutable. That would destroy. I would leave the language for sure. Like it would destroy everything I do. Um, yeah. And that's the thing, like, immediately all these things that come up, different interests. Uh, yeah. And Jay saying... Was talking about uh, the fact that like, U-Socket exists if you want to do sockets. Again, another de facto standard. Um, and hypotheticals, of course, yep. And AK Graham also mentioned Closure Script or Closure CLR. Actually, very true. Closure CLR. AK Graham says, wouldn't you want to have using with multiple bindings which get disposed in reverse order? Yes, I would. Actually, there's another problem we can run into straight away here. And it's something that C Sharp takes care of for you. What if someone... Some horrible human being, or rather, someone who's refactoring some code in a hurry to fix a bug and doesn't notice what they're doing, 
sets foo to something else. And now we run test. And disaster of disasters, this thing that we passed in that we had using at the beginning isn't disposed. Because we've assigned something new to it. So let's expand this macro and we'll see what's going on. We assign food to x. Great, that's the object. That's our thing that must be disposed, our handle. Um, and then we do some work. Cool. And, but then we rebind x to a new thing. And then we dispose that. And that sucks. We're disposing a string and not our handle. So we've just leaked a handle. That's, that's terrible. So what we actually need to do in our code here is we should um, make a temporary variable called temp. And we'll do that as the form. And then we'll bind var to temp. We'll do this let star thing here. And then we'll dispose temp. Oops, and that's not that. Right, so now if we go down here and press G, notice by pressing G that we just re-expanded the macro again and we can see the new effect. So now temp gets bound to foo. And then x gets bound to temp, great. And now everyone can use x just like normal inside here. And they can even set it to a new thing. But when we dispose, we dispose temp. So let's call to test again. Um, and, oh yes, we recompile the macro. Here's an important point. We recompile the macro, but test hasn't changed. And that's because we haven't recompiled test. Macros only expand at macro expansion time during compile. So this test is still using the old code. So we recompile this, call test again. And notice now that we're disposing this handle, even though we're setting X to be a new thing. But in fixing this, we've introduced a new problem because there's this kind of concept of leaky abstractions. You make something um, and it wraps up a concept in a nice way and then you're able to use it and that's really cool. But what if someone else defines temp? What if someone else, like what if they do set of temp? What if they do print temp? This is valid code now, which is also bad. Look at this, they're suddenly able to see what the value um, of this thing is. They can go and cause the same problem we had before by setting our temp to be 10. And once again, we're not disposing of our handle. That sucks. So of course we can go, oh well, you know, we'll just pick a really stupid name. No one's ever gonna have a variable with a, this really stupid name. So it'll be fine. And yeah, maybe, maybe this is a, uh, oops, what have I got there? Oh yeah, temp, we gotta use this really stupid variable name here. Um, compile that again. Yeah, maybe this will get you some distance, but you're really fudging this. You don't really want to rely on a code base that is full of these kinds of hacks. Because I mean, who says with like, because your fix, this hack has to work forever, right? Anyone who uses your library, any code that uses the code from that library, none of them are allowed to generate the same um, variable. So we're in a little bit of a quandary. How do we get a variable name that definitely isn't used by anything else ever? The answer is something called a gensim. If we say, if we call the function gensim, we get back a symbol. And this symbol is never used by anything else. Guaranteed. This is the only time you'll get this symbol. And every time you call gensim, you're going to get a new symbol. Even if you tried to fudge it to get the same one, it will not work. So you can safely use this as a variable name that's always going to be safe. So in our using thing here, we're going to do another let. Um, and we're going to call it var name. And we're going to call it gensim. And then instead of this stupid thing, we're going to call varnin. Sorry, we're going to unquote varnin. Now this got a little bit more complicated, but not too much. Notice that um, this is being executed at compile time. So this stuff, again, looks like code, but we're actually just making a list. The list that's going to be spliced in as code, the result from our macro. 
this stuff is getting run in the body of the macro. So we're making a variable called var name, which has one of these lovely symbols, which is guaranteed not to have been used before and never to be used again. Um, and then we use that as our variable name. And now, like we can go and so let's go and expand this first. Let's have a look. Now we can see that we get this kind of stuff. Foo is bound to this variable, and you can see it again here and here, because we unquote that same var name there, there, and there. And that's great, because it's impossible for um, someone to generate this variable later from another gen sim or to hack it together themselves, so they can never screw with our um, our code. So if we call test now, we can see that. The thing is being disposed. Setting X has no effect on it. We don't have some temp thing that can be a uh, see undefined variable temp. Like this is um, there isn't something there we can get at, so we can fuck it up. So now our code is a bit safer. So actually, let's add that set of X in again because that's just a nice example of some robustness. Dun, 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 dun. CC Mark is saying, oh, scopes, that's what uh, I've wanted, but haven't been able to find. Yeah, it's dope. That used to be, I can't remember what it used to be called. Um, Duangle? Uh, no, Duangle was the game they were working on. I can't remember. It's cool anyway. Um, Tum Dum 3, hello! Uh, Tum Dum saying, is it me or is the stream offline? I hope not. Um, and yes, people just suggesting gen sims to me. Thank you. You are you are faster than my explanations were, but that's exactly where we were getting good stuff. Um, AK Cram saying, couldn't you technically still clash with gen sims? Um, no, you can't guess the next value. They're never interned. Um, basically, it's like defined by the spec that that can't happen and the implementations make it so. And of course, the implementations have all the control. So you can just make sure that that can't happen. It's awesome. Um, Love like Semtex. Hello, sir. Good to have you here. Um, AK Karam, how does it work with multiple threads? Are Gensims a global lock? That is not defined by the spec, so it's not something that you can answer in the general way. Um, but it wouldn't have to be. Okay, cool. So that was making our thing a little more, bit more robust. We could also do the thing that Jace was saying about um, supporting, like having this kind of syntax. So we can say x foo, uh, y bar, and things like this, and do multiple disposes. I won't do that now, because I want to chug on through some of the other content, but that would be interesting. We're going to do a similar kind of task, but we're going to do it in slightly faster, and we're going to make a whole new macro. The problem case is, lambdas are cool, right? Lambdas are nice, useful things. But, because they don't have a name, we can't you call them recursively. And that's kind of a shame, because in Lisp and in functional programming in general, we like to be recursive. There's a lot of things we can do when we're being recursive. Um, some problems just are cleaner when they're defined recursively. Um, so, what we would like is we would like Lambda, but we would like to be able to be recursive in it. And that means inside the scope of the lam lambda, we want to give it a name that we can call and, and get there. So the first thing we're going to do is define um, what we would have to write. So let's let's do a little recursive function. Let's just do um, there's a baz function, and it's going to take some number, and then we're going to say optional. 
vacuum. It's going to start at one, and we'll get to what this does in a minute. Um, and I've just forgotten what the actual name of this function is. It'll come back to me. Actually, your guys will probably tell me. Um, it's really stupid. It's such a simple thing. Anyway, if vacuum is less than equal to zero, then return vacuum. Otherwise, um, we need to recurse. So we're going to say baz uh, x minus one and um, vacuum uh, times x. Okay. So, whoops. Thank you. So this is a function which, if you give it three, it's going to return nothing because I've done it wrong. How have I done that wrong? Okay. If you pass it three, it's going to do three times two times one. If you pass in four, it does four times three times two times one. And what is the fucking name of that? I'm so annoyed. It's such a simple mathematical function. You normally represent it with the exclamation mark. Um, Van Laser, we are going to get to anaphoric macros very soon. Um, so yes, if we do 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, we can see we get 24. Factorial, thank you so much. Thank you. So this is a simple recursive version of factorial. Now, we can't define this function as it is as a lambda, um, because we need to be able to call ourselves, which means you need the name, and we don't have a name. So what we can do is an ugly hack. So we can do, we'll take a lambda, which is going to take x, and then inside... We're going to define a local function called this. Let's call it this. And then we call this with x, right? Now, this big old ugly lambda, if we fun call it, blah, it's getting ugly by the second, with 4, we can see we get the correct answer. But, again, we've got this case where We've got a simple kind of task, right? Something that can be automated. And we're programmers. We like, if it's something can be automated and done precisely, there's a correct way to do this, right? And it can be and it can be done precisely, then we write code to solve it. And we do this for everything, man. Like if it's medical, if it's, it's like just anything you can think of, there's a thousand startups doing all these different things was basing it, basing the whole thing around we throw computers at problems, right? But when it comes to programming, suddenly like, oh no, we can't write code to write code. That's just compilers. Um, so what we would like is we would like a way to write this, right? And we'll give it a different name from Lambda. We're going to call it R Lambda. So it's a recursive Lambda. And we would like to say that if we call a function named this, we're actually talking about the Lambda that we're currently in, the current currently scoped lambda. Um, and that's kind of interesting. So, this at the moment is invalid code, right? If we pull it over here and do r lambda, it's going to say that there is no... Oops, the variable optional is unbound. Oh yeah, it's just basically freaking out. This is not, this is not allowed. So, we're going to have to transform this into something valid. And we know what we can transform it into. We can transform it into this. So we're going to write a macro to do that. We're going to write diff macro, r lambda. Um, we're going to take some args and a body, right? And then we want to generate this code, roughly. Except instead of just x, we want to use whatever args that are actually passed in. And um, this function is going to take the uh, so really these are the arg names right and this yeah this is a function that takes that's going to expand to arg now we'll see we'll see if we get that um, 
Then we have this inner function. We know that its body is going to be body, so I'll just do that quickly. Um, I think this is right. We'll see soon. Okay, so other than a warning saying, hey, you tried to call this like a function before. We've defined this macro. Let's see what it evaluates to now. Let's take our pseudocode from earlier and expand it. What do we get? Well, we get something quite promising. Well, we've got some mistakes here because we don't need this anymore. Um, no, no, that's not right. Do, do that. Right, so we redo that again. Okay. So it results in a lambda, which has the arguments we specified, which then defines a local function called this, and uses the same arguments. And, oh, we've got this mistake here. So we're passing in... Um, at optionals. We don't want to do that. Um, actually, there's a better way of doing this. No, this yeah, this is the wrong. This is the wrong thing. We can simplify this a lot, actually. What if? We just generated this. Okay, so when this executed, this would define, we define a local function, and then we would just return it as a value. And this is kind of neat. So, when we do our lambda, Actually, let's just take this code here and see what happens. Boop. We get back a function. And if we jiggle this around a bit, fun call 10 or 4, uh, we can see we get the result. Now, as someone hinted earlier, uh, that, well, they used the term anyway, um, there's something a little interesting about this. We've introduced a binding that the user never defined. The user never defined that there would be a thing called this. In this case, a function, it could also be a variable. Um, if you think of a lot of um, uh, object-oriented languages, you'll have a self or a this variable, which you never have to define, um, but is available just inside the scope of your method. Think like Java and C Sharp, for example. Um, in Lisp, we would call this an anaphoric variable or anaphoric binding. The user never defined this, but it was defined before you by, um, by a macro. And I think I'm getting that term right, but fancy term for a simple thing. We're creating something that the user doesn't explicitly see in the code, um, but is providing this service. Not the best explanation. We can expand on that later. Look up anaphoric macros. Covered very well in OnLisp, um, and also actually I think in anti common Lisp as well. Um, it's also covered in Letover Lambda, but that's kind of, it's a fairly extreme book, so you should read that with a pinch of salt. It's a very interesting um, book in terms of what someone thinks about uh, coding in Lisp, but it sh isn't about how all Lisps should be written. So yeah, now we've got this thing. We have recursive Lambdas, and we can use these whenever we like. And what's nice is we can take our Lambda and put it in a package and stick it in Quick Lisp and ship it to other people. And so now um, what's really cool here is we have something, we, we've basically made a theory, right? We've got a thesis. Code will be easier to write with the R Lambda macro. And you can put it in the package manager or you can just give it to other people and people can try it in context in their projects. They didn't have to switch language. They didn't have to start a whole new project with different dependencies just to be able to try this one idea. They didn't have to like, you know, Oh, I'm taking up Haskell today because I want to learn about functional programming. That, you know, makes a degree of sense. But this is like a simple theory. Recursive lambdas could be cool. And we were able to implement it in a couple of minutes. Now, sorry I slightly rejiggled this implementation. Um, but it just made it so much easier. Um, so 
so what we end up doing is yeah because the lambda is meant to return a function not evaluate it so this pseudocode was actually wrong um, we did want just this oops but yeah another macro under the belt again very much a syntactic syntactic transformation but it's so much clearer than what we've had before because all you see is oh okay there's this thing called our lambda i should look up what that is and you'll probably have a doc string in here and saying like you know recursive lambda so when people come over here and do the thing to get the documentation you can see what it's for and you would have a nice explanation there of exactly how they use it and then it, it, it shares um, a syntax that they're very familiar with. Oh, it's just like lambdas. I know how to use this. Um, and it works with the kind of code. It's just a function that's being generated. Because you're just generating regular Lisp code, the result that you get back, you can pass to any code that already exists because it's just made of the same stuff. It's normal things. All right. Okay, so we so far we've been looking at these regular macros we define with def macro let's take a quick um spin off for a second to talk about symbol macros they're a very simple thing defun uh test three um yeah now symbol macros are a little bit odd. Let's, let me just um, do this. Symbol macro let x is plus, oh no, get hash a ht. We're going to pass in key and ht, key and ht. This is a little weird. I'm hoping it'll make sense in a minute. Um, Now, this is one of the places where the normal macro expand um, isn't that good. So what a symbol macro let does, it says, hey, any, anywhere you see inside this scope, you see X, replace it with this form. So this will become, this code will become list, get hash, get hash, get hash. Now, I think we can see this. If we do slime macro expand all, Boo. What? Didn't like that. Have I done that wrong? Is it meant to be quoted? I didn't think so, but no. Why do you not like me? Whoops. Oh, yeah. Parens, Chris. Get your parens right. Okay, here we go. Notice how the, the code here has been modified. Everywhere that there was an X, there's now this form. So this get hash is now gonna be called three times. Um, and that matters. This is not just like the same as, it's, uh, it's not the same as this. Because here, we're going to evaluate get hash once and store the result. And then we're going to make a list with the, that result three times. In this one, get hash is going to be evaluated three times. And this does actually have uses. It looks weird. But one of the places it, that you might have bumped into it before, actually, um, is with... Um, the with symbols, what is it? With slots macro. Wait a second, here we go. With slots. And what with slots allows you to do is say, if you pass in an object like our handle, and you want to be able to refer to the um, slots inside the um, object just by like, like with a variable name, we've got, we can say resource here, an object, we're gonna pass in an object, we can say print resource, and then we're going to go setf 
resource to yay and then we're going to print resource again and return object right so test five make instance oops no handle resource oh right So what's happening here is resource gets bound to whatever the resource slot inside this object um, is bound to. And the way where this works, this is just another macro. If we expand it, other than some faff, actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this and we will trim it down a little. There's a few declarations here that we're not so interested in. Um, and then we get down to the meat of it. And let's make it look a little less severe by downcasing everything. And we can see that we've got a symbol macro let going on. And it's saying, hey, everywhere that you see this symbol, replace it with the expression and then replace it with this form, right? This list of stuff. And it's calling slot value, which is the thing that lets you get the value from a slot in an object. So if we take this last handle and we say resource, um, we can see that we get yay out of it. So it's saying, hey, everywhere you see resource, replace it with this form. Now. This is where it becomes really useful um, that we're getting the same form in all these different places. Because here we make a change. We set resource to be a new value. So if this was um, a let statement and this was a slot value resource, then we would here we would just be redefining this local variable. It wouldn't have any effect on the contents of object. Um, oops. And so this is just one of the places that symbol macro let can be used. I haven't actually seen it used in cases other than this. This is the only pattern I've seen it used. And so like basically this is the only way I've used it as well. I'm sure there are other ways. I would love to see some resources on nice uses for symbol macro let, but this is the most common pattern I've seen around is for things like this. Um, so yes, that was our kind of brief detour into with, uh, to symbol macro let. It's a strange beastie. Um, there is also a global um, symbol macro defining thing. I have not seen that used ever, and I have no idea why you'd want to use that, to be honest. Um, it would mean globally the symbol would always be replaced with some expression. And that sounds gross. It just sounds really dangerous. Like it would be so easy to fuck up and bleh. No, don't like it. Not sure what that's used for. Would love to hear about it though. Quick check up on the comments and then we're going to dive back into something. Tom Dum says, sure, but does it mean that a standards compliant implementation can choose not to guarantee that gen sim generated symbols don't collide in the presence of thread? Um, ah, that's an interesting question. I would guess that it, it would be in their interest. It would be a very strange thing not to do. Um, because it just... Yeah, doing all this stuff. Actually, Jace goes through it pretty well, actually. It's just saying, um, yeah, if the symbol isn't in the package table, there's no way to refer to that symbol um, unless you already have a pointer or a handle to it. So GenSim creates a symbol object without putting it in the package table and then returns the object to you. So yeah, you pretty much can't cog that up. It's a, yeah, it's a nice explanation. See, this is what I need. I need all this stuff in my brain. But we're doing the little bits of Lisp version at the moment. And as Jay says here, actually, so it, you're the only one who has a reference to that symbol when you create it using Gensim. Um, and unless you leak that symbol somehow, there's no way for other code to collide with it. And that's basically it, which is really nice. Just you're, you're doing those protections. And I like that you opt into that, that process. You create the variable name. It's a kind of it, it's a bit of extra work to do rather than a hygienic macro system, um, which does this kind of stuff for you. But this is very understandable once you get over the original like problem 
Like once you understand what problem it's trying to solve and you've done this a few times, uh, it becomes pretty easy to spot where you need this. Um, then we get into a discussion about the Y Combinator, which I'm not qualified to go into, so I will not. Um, AK Graham says, the letter of a Lambda Lego is a bit extreme. Yes, he is. I find it really good fun to read. Uh, lots of thought-provoking stuff. But I don't agree with his definitions of a bunch of stuff. And that's just fine. Jace is saying... Um, I've also seen global symbol macros used to implement global lexical variables. Um, and then it says, oh no, global symbol macros uh, have lexical scope. What? Do they? You're saying that a, symbol, a global symbol macro would is only like scoped to the file or something? That's very interesting. I, I, I'll need to go into that. I thought they were global, but... Again, it's an area that seems so dodgy that I haven't looked into that properly, I must admit. Okay, so where are we? We are at 20 past 9. We've still got some more stuff to do. So. Oh yes, let's take a very... Okay, so... Macros can be viewed as like hooks into that compilation process. We looked at a couple of stages. We looked at like the reading stage, where we're taking the strings and turning them into a data structure that the we're going to work with. Turning it into lists. And what's so nice is because we write our code in lists anyway, um, both sides match, you know? What you what gets returned from read um, is a list with exactly the structure. So you, you don't have to do any mental mapping. It's not being turned into some AST node objects that you then have to work with. Um, it's a very one-to-one -one mapping. And it just makes it easier to write because you can use things like quasi-quotation and basically use this like a template for your code. That's really what's happening here. You're just splicing in the bits you need. Um, and then this is going to replace um, the macro call uh, the call site. Now, the the um, we're going to take a quick look at reader macros. And this is going to be a flying visit. I'm only going to talk very lightly about them and that they exist. And I'm not going to explain them much. I'm not going to go into implementing anything. Um, I'm just going to show you that they work. So, like uh, like macros were hooks into that, that place where a bunch of transformation, the macro expansion stage of the compilation process, um, reader macros hook in at the read stage. So when they are, it when the Lisp when the Lisp compiler is going through the file with the code in it or the string with the code in it, and is taking those characters and is constructing um, the lists out of that, constructing your AST. Um, you can hook into there. You can say, hey, if you see this specific pattern of characters, call my function instead, and I'm going to take over. I'm going to take the stream of symbol, uh, stream of characters, and I'm going to read from it for a bit and return you to you, like, what how that should be represented in, as a data structure. And it's kind of cool. There's a lot of things that are implemented um, like that. So... We see things like quasi quotes and this syntax and quote in general. Um, when we were in in other little bits of Lisp episodes, we saw that if we do two quotes here, um, if we take this and we get the first element of it, we'll see that it's is a symbol called quote. We found out that quote foo is exactly the same as foo. So there's this little bit of syntactic sugar. This symbol here gets converted into this form here, which is a lot more normal um, in, in kind of Lisp terms. So this is a little syntactic transformation that's done at read time. And this is this could easily be implemented as a read macro. So what I'm going to do is... Um, well, we can actually see a few places where we have syntax like this. We can one, two, three. So remember, our normal evaluation model is it's the first thing inside the list that dictates what function's being called or what is going to happen, like a macro name or a function name or something like this. But with these ones, we've got some weirdy symbols stuck before the the recognizable part of the expression, before the list or before the symbol or whatever, like that. Um, 
And so this is a literal array syntax, and this is just saying don't evaluate this. We can define our own things like that. So one of the things that kind of people sometimes pick on it, like with Lisp, is you know there's no syntax like in other languages for defining um, uh, dictionaries. So what would it be in like Python? It's something like B two or something like this. And um, there isn't a shorthand syntax like this for defining um, hash tables in a common list. And this can be done, say we wanted to have something, let's make it a little more um, familiar to Lisp stuff. Let's just do, like we have um, hash and this for an array syntax, let's do hash h and none of this silliness. Let's say that we wanted it to be a hash table. Now if I hit return here, it's going to freak out and it's going to say, there is no dispatch function defined for this, right? It does not want know what to do with that syntax. And it's at the point where it's reading the string input stream. This is the read part of this compilation going on here. Um, so we're going to define that syntax. I'm not going to go through how it's done. I'm just going to yell a couple of things at you while I'm doing this. The first thing is that um, defining reader macros is something you'll do very, very rarely. Um, and you should almost never do it. In fact, I would say never do it the standard way um, because reader macros are global. They affect everyone in every package and that sucks. That is just one of the places where the spec is shit and it's really annoying that that exists. Luckily, there is a project called... Um, uh, named read tables. So if I just go to our, um, our ASD file here, you can see I have depended on named read tables. And this provides a way to have um, locally, like file local um, use of a certain read table. So what we can do, what it means is we can define read macros and then we can say in, like we have in package, we can say in read table and provide the name for our reader. Our, yeah, our read table or whatever. And then this file will have access to that syntax. So I'm just going to dump in some code I've got earlier. And this uses that. So we've got a function that's going to take a list of data and it's going to make a hash table. Um, and populate that hash table and return it. So if, if we say, let's compile that now and then say gen hash table and we do um, a1, b2, right? Oh shit, oh fuck, here we go. Sorry, I was testing this before the stream and now we're getting fancy syntax. So my apologies, let me just unfuck this a little. Um, how am I gonna do this? print object is that function um, hash table Ugh. why did I do this oh yeah more really hold on that wasn't what I expected at all Well, this is a little embarrassing. Oh, yeah, it's hash hyphen table. Okay, do that. Hopefully now. Oh, shit, now I've really fucked things up. Never mind. <laughs> Hold on, kids. Quick restart while I just unfuck some mistakes I've made. We also need to use named read tables because I want to take new. Please take new. Objects unbound? Where is that? Oh dear. What have I done? Oh yeah, some of this stuff down here. Okay, so what we'll do instead is we'll go in package and we'll 
compile these guys. And we'll compile this guy, and we won't compile that. We'll compile this guy. We'll compile this guy. Not this one, that was our pseudocode. Right, now let's see if we can do this. Cool. Right, so let's try that again. Pretend that didn't happen. If we call gen hash table with this list of data, we get a hash table which has the data provided. So A and B are the keys, and one and two are the values. So one is mapped to A, two is mapped to B. Pretty simple. Regular function. But that's going to be a helper. And then what we're doing down here is we're defining a. Um, we're saying this pattern of characters, which is the hash symbol followed by H. Um, when the reader sees that, it needs to call this function, which is our function here. We define this. And all we do is we return a call to gen hash table um, with the list of elements. I'm not going to dig into this because, again, there's a lot we could talk about here. But what it means is that we can then go, okay, our read table is named hash table literal. So we go up here and say hash table literal and compile. Uh, then what we should be able to do is go h a 1 b 2 and we get a hash table. So we've just added hash table syntax to the language. You could do it with curly braces as well. I'm not going to do that in this. I leave that as an exercise to other people. Um, but yes, it is trivial to add these things. People have done it for, like Jason's saying, JSON readers and all this kind of stuff. But you have a responsibility. When you start messing around with macros, and especially reader macros, you are now a language designer. You're not just writing functions and all this kind of stuff. You're designing um, this language. And there are a lot of concerns that you have to take into account. And familiarity and things like this are very important to people. And also, how you interact with this stuff. Like Macros are super important to, common, uh, to a common lisp and to common lisp users. So how this is represented like if you stick a quote in front of this and you get this maybe this isn't what you're expecting maybe they expect this um to actually become a hash table at compile time or at read time what effect does that have about what these can be can these be variables anymore probably not right because the variables are not going to be bound until runtime so you you really have to Think very carefully, and it's it's one of those things that's really nice to play with. I highly recommend playing with it in your in like private projects. But try and use them and see where this stuff breaks down. It can be that it's totally valid for certain teams. There are some great talks. Uh, one in particular, I'm thinking of uh, some graphics researchers gave a talk at the Lisp Symposium uh, last year, and they had some insane reader macro shit going on. So basically, almost allowed them to do kind of like C++ style code inside Lisp code and they were just going crazy with this stuff and it and it had a value for them and their team they're a research team they're not shipping product um, they're doing research they're making papers and this helped them and that was cool but um, again this stuff matters you're in a design business now so be careful um, one other thing that's a little gash is the asymmetry of syntax here so what you could do, and again, I don't recommend you do this because you're affecting everyone, and we just saw the effect of this, is you could define a print object method uh, which, which, which redefines how hash tables are printed. So then um, when we make a hash table, this is still a regular hash table, right? But it's just the way it's printed is now slightly different. We print it to have the same syntax um, as is required to to make it. Anyway, that's our little diversion into reader macros. We're not going to stay here and I would need a lot of time on the video to actually go through those in any meaningful way and most of the time you don't need them. I've used them in a few cases. There's one particular um, like uh, I, something I stole from um, Clojure actually. They have this thing where if you do this syntax in Clojure means it's a lambda. So you can do plus one hash. And this is a function that will add one to whatever the argument is. Um, I went like this. Um, in fact, yeah, I think it was I think it was just that. And this will generate a lambda. 
And the reason for this was that the equivalent common Lisp code is something like, and the majority, like about 60% of the characters in this are not dedicated to the actual purpose of the function. So it seems really annoying. This is just a lot of cruft for something very small. So I found this syntax tidier, but it's hairy and there's lots of details and things to get into. So um, yes, beware, beware, beware. There are a lot of people that think reader macros are a mistake. I am not one of them, but um, they require an incredibly light hand and um, a lot of thinking. Okay, so we're at 21.35. We're now going to look at a slightly, uh, should we look at a slightly bigger example? Yes, because I want some context context for doing um, compiler macros. Let's do a really uh, dumb example for com compiler macros first. Let's have a just quick think on what we could do there. Um, da, 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 da. Okay, so we're going to do it, make a macro that you definitely shouldn't make. Um, this is a bad idea. And the reason it's a bad idea is it's an optimization that your compiler does anyway. So don't do it. Don't. Promise me you won't do this. But it is an easy to understand one. Okay, so we have a function called myAd. And it takes two numbers because it's terrible, right? And it adds them together. So now we can say myAd, one and two. Hooray, it's three. But we knew both of these numbers at compile time, right? We wrote them into the code. Like, it was in the thing that was read in and transformed and compiled them. All that jazz. So if the job was just to add them together, then couldn't we do that at compile time? We could add them and get three and replace this whole thing with three. So a really naive way of doing that, the first naive way, is uh, to make a macro. Yeah, all right, so now we have uh, we have a macro. This is great. And for a second, it looks like everything's grand. Look at that. It returns three. And what's really cool is it, it did that at compile time. So if we expand this macro, you can see there is no, there's no function call anymore. Function call's gone. It's just, it's just the result now. Awesome. But there are a load of terrible things. Like say I want to add two, I want to add the number two to the variable A. Uh, this won't work. <laughs> because this macro took the symbol A and the number two and tried to add two to the symbol A. Literally like, oh, fuck's sake. Like this. You can't add numbers to symbols. That doesn't work. So we go, oh, okay, right. Um, we'll just say, uh, if, um, If and number p x and number p y, um, then we'll add them together. Otherwise, we'll just return the code um, to add them together, right? And we'll have to unquote that because we don't know what we're passing in yet. And suddenly, yay! Oh no, not that. You know, yep, that still works. And then if we have a local variable called a, that works too. Awesome, we've done a great job. Except now, of course, that my ad isn't a function anymore, so now you can't you can't call it like this, which sucks. Now you've lost all this value that you have by using like a functional programming. You can't pass this to map. You can't pass it to reduce. You can't do any of that cool stuff. This is shit, right? So um, there is a different kind of macro, which does a slightly different thing. Its specialty. It's used in exactly the same way as. Uh, that's not strictly true. It's used in a very similar way as to how uh, def macro is used. But the cool thing about it is that it can have the same name as a function. And the what's interesting about this is it being expanded is optional. Your compiler does not have to expand this macro. It does not have to transform a call to my ad into this. Um, most of, a lot of them do, a lot of them do, but they don't have to, and that's very important. So this is an optional thing, and it's used generally for optimizations, things when you know something about the code that the compiler doesn't, and you can provide some kind of uh, fast path. So now we have this nice thing like, oh, look, um, my ad works. In this case, it's gonna get transformed into plus A2. 
Um, but if this were 10 and 2, like this, then my ad's going to be transformed into 12. Isn't that great, right? Macros. Awesome. This is terrible. Don't ever do this because all these mathematical things are things that your compiler knows how to do. These are like bread and butter compiler transformations. Don't be doing this. You're just making things worse for yourself. You're doing lots of work and you're just pissing away like your time, especially. But you're also making your co code base more complicated and all that kind of stuff. Profiling is the key of optimization, nothing else. And, you know, thinking about your problem side, of course, as well. Efficiency with algorithms, speed with data structures, and all that kind of jazz. Right, so that is a compiler macro. It's a, it is almost the same as a regular macro. It's expanded in a very similar way. Um, they're used in your code in a very similar way. But they can share a name with a function, um, and they are optional for the compiler to expand, and they have this kind of optimization use case. Again, big warning, make sure that whatever this expands to is always going to evaluate to the same thing that the function would evaluate to. Oh, one thing. Because otherwise, you never know what the result is going to be. Because if this did one thing and this did another thing, and the compiler doesn't always have to court to expand this, then you don't know at what part of your code base you're getting what behavior. One of the cases that you might not get an expansion is like this. Because now we're passing it around as a function. If we stick this def var uh, temp that, so now we have some variable called temp, and I do fun call temp uh, with 10, or whatever it is, 10 and 2, that works, but the compiler can't at this point tell what function is going to be called here. So it can't do this, it can't expand this. So in that case, you're going to get this, right? So it's very important, make sure that it does the same thing. Now, we are gonna go into a slightly longer example. It's gonna be a bit meatier, and uh, we're gonna try and do this. We might overrun very slightly, um, but we will get through. And I'm just gonna have one last look at the comments before we dive in. Um, AK Karam saying, is that Lambda shorthand something Emacs prettifies, or is that a Unicode Lambda? That is Unicode. Um, yeah, I uh, I actually implemented that as a reader macro. It's available in the, the package FN. Hey, Darius. Sorry that you got um, held out by Twitch. It seems very hit or miss who's getting let in and who isn't. Um, Now I'm getting some advice in the chat regarding Unicode stuff. Right. So what I would like to do, what I would like to implement is something rather different. We would like um, to have a function which dispatches to different um, function bodies based on the number, the arity of the function. So what we're going to do is we're going to define a function like foo, and it's going to take um, like x and y. If it gets an x and y, I want it to multiply them, right? x and y like this. And if it gets a, um, what would it be? Yeah, x, y, and z, um, I would like to subtract them. This isn't a useful function, but this is what I wanted to have. And it's based on how many arguments are passed in. So if you pass in two arguments to foo, you're going to get this. If you pass in three arguments, you're going to get this, and so on, right? So this is what we want. Um, Def a fun, or define a fun. That's what we're going to call it, define a fun. Um, this is what we want. So now we've got to write the expanded version. We want to see, we want to understand for ourselves what this would expand into. So we would have something like, we don't know how many arguments we're passing in, so it's going to have to just be rest args, like this. So that will allow us to pass in any number of arguments. And then we're going to have to get the length of args. And then we're going to have to do a case statement. And depending on, we're going to have to have one clause which says if it's if the length is 2, um, then we want to do this. And if the length is 3, 
we want to do this. However, in this, we don't know what x, y, and z are because they're defined here. So what we really want is something like uh, destructuring bind x, y, and pass in args, like that. I think this might work. Okay, x, y, z, args. Okay, so foo compiles, and if I if I call foo with um, one and two, it's two. If I pass in um, 10 and 20, I get 200. And if I pass in 10, 20, and 30, I get minus 40, because in that case, the length is three, so it's calling this. Also, I'm gonna change this to e case, because at the moment, if I pass in like no arguments, it just returns nil, and that's not right. I want it to error, so let's do that. Now foo is gonna say, ah, oh, fell through ecase expression one, in, one of two or three. That's a very unhelpful error, but we're gonna live with it for now. Um, so this is the code that we want to generate. And this, given this input, we wanna generate this. And now we're gonna write a macro to do it. So def macro is gonna be called define a fun. We're going to be giving it a name, and then it's going to have a body, which is a bunch of clauses. Notice when we were doing this, the indentation looked kind of weird. Um, and then we define this with at body, and we're just going to compile this. It's going to complain that we're not using any of the arguments yet. This macro does nothing. But if we go up here and re-indent now, notice how the indentation is now correct. And that's because of that at body symbol rather than at rest or anything like this. And so now we want to generate this code. So we're going to have e case. We're going to have a length. Uh, no, we're not. We're going to have to generate a lot more than that. We're going to have to generate defun. We're going to have to generate the name. Like we, we're splicing in the name of the function. And then we're going to take args like this. And then we need to generate these clauses. So the way we're going to do that is with a loop. So we're going to say loop for. Um, Let's have a look. Loop for, um, I'm gonna split this in half. We're gonna have clause args, which is C args and C body in, um, what is, is this from? In clauses. And then we're gonna collect and we're going to do back quote. Notice that again, because we done this um, normal uh, comma here, now we're executing code again. So this was make a list. This is uncomment. And uh, we're executing code again. And now I'm doing another back tick within this. And now we're making lists again. You get, kind of get used to this after a while, but um, you could factor this out into different functions. And we might do that yet, yet but um, we'll see how far we go with this first. So we want to generate this code. So we're going to make a list where the first element is the length of, uh, of C args. Let's actually do it like this. We'll do for C len uh, is equal to length of C args. And then we can just splice in C len. So it's a list that starts with the length and then has this destructuring bind thing going on. with the C args and then the C body. Something like that, except the body is gonna be a list. Um, so we're gonna do, we're gonna splice in that list. Okay, let's expand this now and see what we get. Okay, so we get a function that has these numbers and these forms, which is close, but also we don't have case. We don't have E case, so we're missing this. Um, So now this is starting to look quite good. This and this are looking rather similar. Length of args, all that kind of stuff. So now if we if we just compile this, what happens? No errors. Let's call foo with um, two arguments. Let's do our 30 and 30 again. We get 900, good, 30, 30, 30. We get minus 30, sweet. Okay, so now this is syntax for defining multiple arity functions. 
But there is one little thing. There's one, one little case is we're having to do this lookup, right? This macro here generates code, or generates a function which does a lookup based on the length of the arguments. Now, a lot of times we know how many arguments there are being passed in. We know this, like, because we write this in the code, we know that there are three arguments. So we know we're going to get this clause. So maybe we change this macro to generate like specific functions and we call the, we replace this call with the call to that specific function because we know stuff that the compiler might not at compile time. Now, I think this is the something the compiler will optimize away as well, but let's just go for it. So what do we want to do? Now we don't want to just generate a foo function, Krogan. We want to generate some other functions as well. We're going to generate um, a foo two function, which takes x and y, um, and we're going to generate a foo three function, that takes x, y, and z. We don't need the destructuring bind stuff. We just need this, right? We'll do this, and then we'll introduce, we'll generate a compiler macro. So we'll have a macro creating a macro that is going to affect our function calls. And we'll see how they come together. So how do we do this? We're going to go down here. We're going to put a prog in around this. Now notice that this is being used as a top level form. This is not within anything else. You are not allowed to use defn outside of a, it is not, it's not correct to use defn outside of a top level form. Progen also allow, it, anything inside, a, if a progen is at the top level form, anything inside it is also a top level form. If you go to the hyperspec and look up processing of top level forms, this will explain um, when something is considered a top level form. Um, and it matters in cases for reasons. Um, Yes, but we got to plow on because I'm running out of time and we are already going to overrun. So what we're going to do down here is we're going to make another loop. And we're going to do a similar thing again. Loop for this in clauses. And we're going to collect. And we're going to do some stuff down here. What are we going to do? We're going to generate functions like this. So we need a function name for f name is equal to and this is um i've uh, pulled in a package called um alexandria i recommend using it um because it's used in so many common list packages that if you're depending on anything you probably are already loading it anyway so you may as well use it and it's got this nice uh, little function called symbolicate have i not put it in the package i might not have no okay so Alexandria. Oh, come on, Chris. Stop fucking them out. Um, symbolicate. And if you pass in some symbols, like foo and then bar, it will turn them into a single symbol that composes, composes the names together and interns it. So we get a symbol called foobar. And we're going to use this because we want to generate uh, function names that look like this. The, the name of the whole function, the slash, and then the arity. Which is kind of like Erlang syntax, to be honest, but whatever, it'll work for us. So we're going to do this. We're going to do symbolicate. We're going to take the name from here, the name of the whole function. Um, we're going to take a slash. And we're going to take a number. Now, I tested this before and I found out that Symbolicate really doesn't like numbers. So I'm just going to... What is the what is the easiest way to turn a string into a, a number into a string? Because string doesn't work. Um, so I've just been using format. Now, this is just me being lazy because I don't know what the thing is. Um, and we also need to know the length of the arguments. So we're going to take this from before and we're going to do clen. This is horrible. It's not pretty, but we will keep going. Okay, so we've got f name. So this is the name of our function. So we're generating defun f name. It's taking the c args and it's doing c body. And now when we expand our macro again, where's our lovely macro up here? 
we can see that we just get the loop. This isn't what we wanted at all. We wanted this. And the reason is we've got this whole loop here inside of this list, but we haven't unquoted it. So let's uh, do this. And press G again, and there we are. Those are the functions that we wanted. So now we've got foo2 and foo3. So the last thing we're going to do is we're going to use a compiler macro. And we're going to define a compiler macro for foo that when it knows the number of arguments is going to call these directly. It's just going to expand into a call to this directly. So what would that look like? Let's, again, we go through our normal uh, design process where we go, what would that look like? We do define compiler macro for foo. And it would take and rest args. Um, it's going to do, it's going to look a lot like the implementation actually, to a point. Um, it's going to say, hey, look at the number of arg arguments being passed in, get its length. And if it's that, then what we want to omit is uh, a call to foo2. Um, Actually, no, it's almost exactly the same, because in this case, we're not destructuring what the actual values are, just um, the forms that are making it up. So this is going to replace with a call to four, foo2 like this. This is going to replace with foo3. Okay, that, that will be what we want. That is roughly what we're going for. And if we get it right, what we should get is we call foo with two arguments and we expand it. That was not what I expected. Oh yes, I see what I've done. We have to make sure that we are um, generating code, not calling the function at compile time. So we do this and then we do Two, one and two and we expand it and we see that it gets replaced with a call to this specific function um, which is the sp arity specific version of this Whew, there's a lot going on but we're going to keep on hammering away because we are going to get get there so this is going to be name this is going to be arrest args uh, let me do this e case and then we're going to have to do another loop. We've got, see, we've got macros making, uh, we've got a regular macro defining a compiler macro which affects code generated by this macro. So this is a rather advanced example, this kind of nesting going on. But this is really useful and we'll see that like, might be really useful, who knows. If you want multipolarity dispatch, then maybe this is useful to you. I still don't think it's the best way of doing it, but you know, it's fun. And we, we saw before, this code is very like this code, right? In fact, what we could do is we could rewrite this to be even simpler. We could say, instead of destructuring this stuff, we could just replace this with cons foo2 onto args. Like this. So whatever these arguments are, this is the un this is the unevaluated arguments. So symbols and lists and all that kind of stuff. Just code. It's the code. And then to make a valid call, we just need a function name at the beginning. So we just cons that symbol right at the beginning, and uh, we're good to go. This is simpler to generate. So <laughs> let's go with that. Um, so we're going to steal this code from earlier. We're going to split up the C args and C body. We're going to get the length. And then we need to, what else do we need? Oh, we're going to need this name as well. So it, let's uh, spin that out into a separate function. Uh, a fun name. Um, name. Len. Oh, Arity. Cool, a fun name. We can just call it like this and CLAN. Notice again, 
we don't have anything magical here. As long as a function is already defined, we can use it from a macro, which is awesome. Uh, you'll find some edge cases, but like, you'll find some interesting times um, if you try to use. Oh yeah, I'll, I'll try not to dig into that too much right now. Let's let's finish off what we've got. Um, cons a fun name name onto args. We don't have to unquote args because. Um, it's coming from here. This function was called with one argument one wants exactly two. Which function? Which function? Oh, a fun name. One CLAN. Right. Finally. Let's go and see if let's take this syntax. Let's expand this macro and see what we get. Cool. So it defines a function called foo, which will do the check for arity at runtime and dispatched the, like the right code, which is great, but it would be cool if it was faster. So we define two dedicated functions, one for each arity. And then we define a compiler macro, which will look at compile time to see the lengths of the arguments and generate a function call um, to one of these. Uh, let's see if everything's gonna work in the last few seconds. No errors. And let's call it something different just so, um, it's definitely not colliding, I think. We do blah, we pass in one and two, we get two. Actually, let's do it with bigger numbers. They're multiplying. Those are subtracting, cool. But then we macro expand this and we see we're getting a direct call to blah three, which means we are not calling um, the slow version of this function at runtime. We're not calling this we're calling this. And depending on how you set up various compiler flags, that might be a lot tighter compiled machine code and you're gonna get see some, you could potentially see some performance benefits there depending on your code, again, profile. But that is a much more advanced um, example. I mean, not in the scope of like the wider scope of um, list programming, but for beginner stuff, this is quite a lot to chew through. So don't worry if this was overwhelming. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to push this code up. Um, I'm just going to mark these so that you can compile them by doing control CC, but they will not be um, evaluated at compile time. Uh, I'm going to put those on all of our protocode things. Let's just go through. Um, not that. Right, I'm also going to remove, I'm going to comment out all of the reader macro stuff because this stuff is dangerous. And I don't, I mean, please play with it, but, um, you know, I, I don't want that to be everyone's first experience is uh, fucking around with that. So, let's do this. Let's do this. We're nearly there. I think we're good. Cool. Right, I'm going to push this code up to GitHub. Yay, stream! And with that, I think we run into a, like, just run to the end of our little session here. Um, I'm now going to open it up to you guys for questions. I'm going to go through those comments. But I'm just going to, I'm going to and I'm just going to have a quick wrap up on what we've been talking about. Although there's a lot going on here, the complex stuff that we were seeing really was uses of quasi-quote, which has nothing to do with macros. It's about making lists. And our, because we have our code, because we write our code as a data structure, um, its representation at compile time and what we see in the text file are the same. And that's really helpful to us because then it makes it a lot easier to define these transformation stages, these macros of different kinds that are gonna hook into the compile process and do things to our code. And we are programmers. If something is automatable and needs to be done precisely, that's a really good candidate for getting a program on it because humans fuck things up. And also humans get confused by visual noise. So if we can remove that from uh, things, that's great. We also write APIs and APIs end up being languages. Like even though they're made of functions and classes and all this kind of things, there's things you're not meant to do and things that are invalid to write there that are incorrect 
within that API, but not necessarily in the wider scope of the language. So there are cases where you can write macros which limit the chances that you'll run into those kinds of problems. Your users will run into those kind of problems. And so you're providing a service to them by, like, by basically treating your API as the language it is. And this matters. There's all kinds of useful uses for macros, um, especially again, like we've seen some of the things in the efficiency side. Um, you'll see that a lot of like there are the most popular um, regular expression uh, library for Common Lisp takes your regular expression at the little string, transforms it into Lisp code, which means at compile time, which means that's going to get compiled down to machine code, and it's going to get all the optimization passes that your compiler has. So it's going to remove dead, um, dead parts. It's going to remove. It's going to optimize all that code in ways that it knows how to do for your specific architecture. So then your regex, your little string, is now an optimized function. That's great. That's why, at least for a long time, common list regular expressions are faster than the ones in Perl, and their engine is written. Their regex engine is written in C. Why is this? Because we use the compiler strengths. And what's so nice about all that stuff is it didn't have to be baked into the language. We didn't have to beg and plead for someone to implement this specific thing. Someone in the in who had an itch, who was interested in this thing, was able to go and make a library where it works and it was able to get it out to people without waiting for another iteration of the standard. The same goes for patent matching libraries. Go look at Optima, which is a which is again big old macro stuff that expands it that expands your pattern matches into what they actually are which is a bunch of statements um, but it's done in smart ways uh, you can also see stuff like this in Keppel the, the stuff that I normally work with um, every week there we write things like defund G and though, like define a function except this function is going to run on the GPU because of this hyphen G Obviously, that's actually a macro that expands to a bunch of code on how to. It calls a compiler, which it like takes the Lisp code, and passes it off to a compiler, which translates into GLSL. It generates all this surrounding infrastructure for getting it uploaded to the GPU and passing up and down arguments and results and all this kind of stuff. All of that is possible because of macros. Um, while Common Lisp is not the only um, language which has an interesting macro system, it is one of the nicer ones. I also recommend checking out Racket. Those guys are doing uh, out of this world kind of stuff in their system. Um, I like the simpleness of this. I like that it's just functions, but there are limitations and there are some things that those guys can do which are just, just crazy, which is really cool. Um, what I'd like to say as well is that macros are these kind of little functions. They're little programs that take source code and return source code. And we have a name for programs that take source code and translate it into different source code. They're compilers. So macros are really kind of tiny compilers. And that's an interesting just addendum on this kind of thing. Um, that's really it. Um, I suppose as well, macros are fun. Not everything has to ship, not everything has to scale. Go make some wacky stuff and have a good time. Um, and that's basically my little, yeah. Two and a bit hour rant on macros. Thank you so much. Let's get to the comments and a bit of coffee for my throat, which is suffering. Ah. Right, getting the right computer. Ooh, lots of comments. Oh, I love this. So nice to have a good chatty gang in tonight. You all rule. Uh, hello to those folks that I didn't see at the beginning, um, especially out to destroy computers. And CSE Mark, when you came in, and Commander Root, AK Karam, I know you guys came in later. Big love to you. Thanks for hanging out. Um, let's see where I got to. AK Karam saying people prefer keyboard symbols uh, to symbols inside of a loop. Yeah, I certainly do. I just like the fact that it gives me different highlighting. It also changes the indentation slightly um, in ways that I prefer. So um, yeah, I, I like just being able to glance at this and there's a, some, a bit of color highlighting telling my eyes where to go to. Um, Uh, 
And AK Graham saying colon equals is pretty Pascal like there. Yeah. And uh, prolong on Erlangy, I think. <clears throat> hey, write to string five. Let's have a look at that. Write to string. Cool. <laughs> it's just as long. But it's slightly more correct. So let's go with that. Awesome. Thank you, sir. That's great. Make sure that our macro still works. Love like Sam just said, my brain just had an audible creak noise. No worries, man. Sorry, I, I did throw a lot. We did a quite a quite a jump um, in content from where we were at the beginning to now. Um, I think it's kind of interesting that. Uh, Again, you define macros, and macros can define more macros and things like this. And it's not a... This isn't like a trick. This isn't like a party favor when you put in a cape and do something silly. This is really useful stuff. Um, and it's code that you will see in, in real life, and I, I think that's really cool. Not necessarily this example, but um, it's very interesting. Uh, you'll also find if you start like, macro expanding things... Uh, this will be ugly, by the way. But... Um, when you expand defun, you start seeing, oh, like a lot of things are just made of the same stuff. Like defun is basically like we have a named lambda concept inside the inside this specific compiler. Um, and they're calling some function, some compiler internal function that takes the name and a named lambda and, you know, makes that available to you. So that's kind of cool. And some stuff with a source location. Ah, and that's a macro as well. Look at that. And so it's really, I don't know, I find it really reassuring in Lisp to move around and just see that you're using the same tools as the guys that make it, for the most part, you know? Like, they, they've got some extra tricks up their sleeve that are outside the spec, of course, but um, the major a lot of these compilers are written in Common Lisp, so there's they made tools as well. But I think it's really cool that you can go and see how stuff is done. And then again, in the end, it boils down to functions. Functions everywhere. Um, AK Graham saying, there seems to be a delicate line between useful macro optimizations and spiraling into total macro madness. Absolutely. Again, your compiler is probably really good, especially SBCL, CCL, all those guys. Really good at doing various transforms. Test things first. Like... Profiling, especially performance stuff, is really counterintuitive. And you really have to understand not just um, what's going on with your code um, as it gets compiled down to like maybe to the machine code level, but you've also got to think about what kind of... You need to know what data you're throwing at this thing. You have to have some kind of idea of what you're working with. It's like, hey, you might um, optimize dispatch um, in your specific program like oh yeah i've done this and now it if when you get up to 20 arguments it's now 100 times faster than it normally is in common lisp and then you build your project and you only ever pass it three arguments it's not faster because you never got to the place where your optimizations had any measurable effect measure 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 and test there's no other way <laughs> the real dj is saying there's no line it's more of a sort of fog yeah AK Graham saying, we need some sort of standard sanity check for macro writing. Yeah, that would be problematic. Error macro is too simple. That's funny. Yes, and Jace is bringing out the golden rule. If you can write it as a function, write it as a function. Don't use macros unless you have to. In fact, what you should generally do is, we've done some fairly syntactic transformy kind of macros here. But a lot of the function, like when you're doing things for functionality reasons, write the function write a function that does what you need it to do first and then if you need a macro just generate have the macro generate a call to that function that does the work it's just way better for you and you, you, again you will be able to recompile that individual function and it will affect everything other than otherwise you have to re-expand the macro and stuff like this yeah it's uh it's the golden rule if you can write it as a function write it as a function AK Graham saying, if you, if you, I think if you generate too much code in closure, the JVM freaks out some class 
method bytecode limit. Ugh. That's a that's a JVM thing. That's not closer's fault, but it's a little bit gross. Oh yeah, 64k I think ought to be quite enough. <laughs> yeah, six, there's there's a 64,000 uh, method limit in Java by default, but you can. Oh no, wait, that's bullshit. That's um, I'm thinking of Dalvik on Android. So they've got those. Oh, 64k as in kept kilobytes kind of thing. Jason saying that trivia is better than Optima. I haven't tested trivia yet. I really should do. I think it's like syntactically matches um, Optima right, but just is slightly uh, better performing. Um, Van Lays is asking, uh, do you have a link about the reader macros uh, video with the crazy guys doing the C++ stuff? Maybe. Problem is, it was done at that it was it was held at that um, at the programming conference um, back in 2017, and the folks that did the video recording there were frankly a bit shit. It was really annoying. Like, so many people can't make it to ELS, and so it's so painful when you don't get videos out. Where are the talks? Where are the videos? They've got to be somewhere. Let's just do that. ELS 2017 videos. I don't know. I don't know. We'll have to do that off stream, I think. But yeah, check out on YouTube. I'm pretty sure those videos were put up. Um, Real DJ saying the colon equals is small talk too. Cool. Love like Santos saying love these kinds of streams. Oh, cool, man. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm gonna be interested to see what the feedback is from the gen from the regular um, little bits of Lisp viewers, because I don't know what overlap there is between them and the pushing pixels of Lisp. I know there's plenty more who watch that stuff than watch these streams, which makes sense because two hours is a long time, and this one's gonna be a long one. So we'll see what the feedback is, and if people want more of this, I'm happy to do this. I like. I really want to go through more things. We can do some. We can do some more stuff on this subject. But um, yeah, you know, what do we add here? Write to string. Oh yeah. Bad commit messages. Woo. Right. I think that's it. Thank you all so much for hanging out. I hope this was fun. Um. Send any suggestions in Reddit comments or in YouTube comments or just yell at me online. Um, I'm sorry I haven't been on IRC as much. We'll try and get back there. I've been very, very busy with work. and But I'm slowly getting the hang of it. I've, uh, I've got myself settled now into Erlang and I'm starting to be productive. So it's uh, so yes, I'm hoping I'll have a bit more time. But as of now, actually, I'm going to go back to work. So um, thanks all. Catch you next time. Peace.